Hey there, I'm Joe Weems. Before we get into the video, I want to remind you about NGConf 2023 happening in Salt Lake City, Utah on June 14th and 15th. Head over to ngconf.org to check out the speakers, check out the talks, and to get your ticket before they all sell out. We'll see you there. Well, Lara is a tough act to follow, and there's only one way to follow an act like that. That's by talking about a riveting topic like security. <laughs> Let me set the scene. Sadly, this, is gonna be a, this isn't going to be a mystery. This is going to be a horror story. Let's say that you're a fan of K-dramas. I mean, who isn't, right? Well, you're such a fan of K-dramas, you work on a K-drama fan site. One day, you navigate to your own site to add comments about your favorite K-drama, and when you're there, you see there's already awful comments written in your name, and you know you're not the one who added them. Oh no, what do we do? How do we stop this from happening to other K-drama fans? We need to add security to our site. Because web vulnerabilities can cause risk to our assets. That is our application, our data, our end users, and their data, and our reputation. Not to mention the financial impacts are significant. And it all adds up to liability. We, as web developers, have a responsibility to follow security best practices and incorporate that into our application. And this isn't something we can just throw over the fence to the security team. So who am I to be talking to you about this? I'm Elisa Duncan. I'm a senior developer advocate at Okta and Angular GDE on the core team of NG Girls, and I'm a fan of K-dramas. You, can... <laughs> you can follow me on the socials at Elisa Duncan. I'm also a regular dev, which means I know just enough to get myself in trouble, especially when it comes to security, because I'm not an expert. However, recently I've had an opportunity to better understand Angular security mechanisms, you know, as part of my job, and I walked away with a renewed sense of appreciation for all the cool things Angular does for us, and I wanted to share that with you today. Well, you can't talk about security without talking about the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP. This group goes through and identifies web vulnerabilities and categorizes them. They then create a list based off of incidences and impact. And they release this prioritized list uh, most recently in 2021 as the OWASP top 10. Since these are all web vulnerabilities, we should have awareness of them. But today, we're going to focus on just two, the number one vulnerability broken access control and the number three vulnerability injection, starting first with injection, which includes cross-site scripting the bane of web developers, right? This occurs when there's not good data and code boundaries and values. And then we take those polluted values and incorporate them in the application, which allows attackers an opportunity to perform unauthorized actions. So an example cross-site scripting attack looks like this. If we go back to our K-drama fan site, you can navigate to an individual K-drama where you can add comments. Well, since this is a public forum for comments, who knows what people are going to write? It's inherently dangerous, right? We've been outside of security concerns. The hope is that people will write comments in text and be very, very sweet. But you know that's not what happens. There's always that jerk, and someone's going to add a comment like this, where they're trying to run a, an alert or a JavaScript script on clicking a link. So this comment is added to the database, and the next time an unsuspecting K-drama fan arrives at the site, they see that link for free prizes. And who isn't tempted to click on a link for free prizes? So they do and get this alert that says, yikes. Luckily, just seeing a JavaScript alert is startling, but otherwise uh, innocuous. However, the precedent it sets is incredibly dangerous, because once an attacker can run their script in your application, they can impersonate you. They can perform unauthorized actions. They can read and capture sensitive data, including your login credentials, and even run malware against your machine. Now, I happen to think that K-drama fan sites are incredibly critical. However, I can see some of you all might think that it might not match the criticality of the applications you work on your day jobs. So consider what happens if the application is financial, HR, or healthcare. Furthermore, consider what happens when the attack user has elevated access within your application. Now they're able to view even more critical data and, even more, and run even more impactful actions. Yikes. So we need to watch out for cross-site scripting when there's poor data hygiene. That is, we're not properly escaping and sanitizing values. 
and when we take polluted, untrusted values and incorporate it into our application using injection sinks. Fortunately, Angular treats all values as untrusted, which means it handles the data hygiene for us. And without any effort on our part, we will have security. And I will show you all the ways Angular helps keep us safe. Angular automatically escapes values when we incorporate it using interpolation. So if we add our comments to our application like this, even if that comment is a purposely broken image that runs a script, if we view that comment in the application, we see the text exactly as is because Angular has escaped it and there's nothing for the browser to interpret and run. We can further inspect that in DevTools by seeing that paragraph node with the text as is. Angular also sanitizes values when we property bind it to syncs. Syncs are web API functions that allow us to create dynamic content that we all expect today in our web applications, such as methods that append to the DOM using inner HTML, approaches to load external resources, such as an image's source, anchor tags href, or even a styles URL, and event handlers. So if we incorporate comments by property binding to the inner HTML attribute of the paragraph, what we'll see with this broken image comment is a broken image. And if we view it in DevTools, what we'll see is that image element, but no error function. And we'll see a warning from Angular saying it has sanitized some HTML and stripped some content. So let's unveil the secrets of Angular sanitization, because this is not just any bag of tricks. Angular maintains lists and lists of safe elements and attributes. So after you, Angular builds out the tree that is the view, it then traverses through the tree and inspects every element and attribute for us to make sure it's safe. So if we take a look at Angular's code where it does this, we're going to step through this code line by line together. I'm just joking. I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> this is my interpretation of what it does, a lot of tedious work that we don't have to do. And I want to draw your attention to these lines. This is where it is checking its list of valid elements, list of valid attributes, and even attributes that explicitly require sanitization. So if we walk through what Angular does with this broken image comment, we first see that image is a safe void element and is allowed to be uh, retained. Next, we look at the attribute, starting with source. Source is an attribute that explicitly requires sanitization. However, in our case, there's nothing to sanitize. So it is safe, and it makes this image uh, element valid and left in the view. And then lastly, that on error attribute is not a safe attribute, and that is why it's removed. If we change our exploit to a previous example, which is that free prizes here link, we view this in the application, we see that link for free prizes. And if we inspect DevTools, we see the anchor tag with the href of unsafe colon JavaScript alert, and a warning that Angular has sanitized unsafe URL. URLs have a safe regex pattern that it matches against, and it always requires sanitization. In our case, our URL isn't safe, so that's why we see the console warning and where Angular prepends that unsafe colon to the URL, which makes it so the browser is no longer able to interpret it and run it, and nothing happens when you click on the link. Therefore, we're safe. Angular also allows safe markup. This is really helpful whenever you have a rich text editor for your comments, for example. So if we want to allow the comment, it's a wonderful drama the best in strong font, we can view it as is uh, in strong font in the application because strong is a valid inline element. Angular also protects us against mutation cross-site scripting, which is pretty darn neat. Mutation cross-site scripting is when HTML that was formerly inert, that is safe, becomes unsafe through the process of browser parsing the markup. This might happen because browsers are helpful and they'll autocorrect things for us, and attackers are sneaky and they'll try to exploit it. So what Angular does is verify the HTML is stable during this process, and it'll repeatedly check all the elements and attributes to make sure that we ultimately have a safe, a safe application. Isn't that thorough? So as you can see, without any effort on our part, we have security when we use Angular constructs, such as property binding and interpolation. And that Angular does the hard work of escaping and sanitizing for us, so we don't have to do any of that tedious work. So always use Angular constructs when you can, because when you do, you have the most amount of safety. Now, there might be a reason that you want to bypass Angular security. 
And when you do this, you're under, entering into some dangerous territory because you're walking away from that built-in security mechanism that Angular has. However, there are some legitimate reasons why you might want to do this, like when you legitimately need video trailers in your KDROM application. What we're going to do here is we're going to bind a trusted video link to an iframe source. And notice I'm saying trusted. This is because we're not going to get that sanitization from Angular, so we have to assert that that value is trustworthy. So if we incorporate this in a component, we'll inject the DOM sanitizer. And the DOM sanitizer has these bypass security trust methods for the type of value that we're trusting, in our case, a resource URL. And this returns a safe type of value we're trusting, a safe resource URL, which is how it, we signify to Angular that this is a value that we, is trustworthy and able to property bind to that iframe source. Safe URLs are unusual in that it might contain valid bits of code, so it's really hard for Angular to sanitize it. Now, I mentioned safe type or value type a couple of times. And what that really is is security context, of which Angular defines five, if you don't include none, that is. So Angular supports HTML style, script, URL, and resource URL. And the reason why Angular defines this is because it needs to know what sort of value it is to do the sanitization. It doesn't know on its own. So we have to be explicit about it. If we take a look at the DOM sanitizer's methods, we see that there's bypass security trust methods for each one of those security contacts. Additionally, there's an explicit sanitize method that takes a security context as a parameter. This way under the covers is how Angular does its own internal sanitization. Yeah, you might be wondering, though, now that I've talked about security context and having to explicitly define what value type it is, why did we not have to define that type whenever we did the property binding with the inner HTML earlier? That's because Angular tracks which security context to use based off the attribute you're binding to. So if we take a look at Angular's code, we see that there's maps. We're just defining the security context with the different sorts of elements and attributes of which inner HTML is one of them. So just remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Just because you can bypass Angular security doesn't mean you should. You definitely shouldn't. And if you do, always get a security uh, audit to make sure you have safety and that you're not opening yourself up for vulnerabilities. Next, we'll talk about the number one OWASP vulnerability, broken access control, which includes cross-site request forgery. So cross-site request forgery occurs when the application shares session cookies to untrusted sources. And an example attack looks like this. Let's say you're doing some online banking, and your bank uses cookies to manage sessions. Next, you check your email, and you're kind of tempted by this one fishy email. And you know, no judgment here. We're not immune from clicking fishy links. Unfortunately, the sender of this email is an attacker who is targeting your bank because your bank has some dubious security practices. So you click on the link, and it takes you to a malicious site. And that malicious site has a hidden form that makes a form post to your bank, Yikes Bank. And it asks for a money transfer. Unfortunately, since your bank doesn't verify the authenticity of this request, and because you have that active session cookie that you pass right along, the bank allows this transfer to go through, and the attacker is able to walk away with your hard-earned cash. So some mitigation strategies for CSRF is to protect your cookies using built-in browser capabilities, such as same site attribute, security headers, or even uh, uh, content security policies. And with that, you have good baseline securities for CSRF. If that isn't enough and you want extra protection, then you could follow a pattern where you're exchanging CSRF token. How this works is the back end will provide the front end a special cookie, that's a CSRF token cookie, with a value. Now, whenever the front end makes a call to the back end, it'll pass back that cookie as, long, as well as that token value in a secondary source. And the back end does verification to make sure that this call is authentic. There is back end work to do in this mitigation pattern, which is also known as the double submit cookie pattern. How Angular helps is it provides an HTTP client XSRF module that you would use in conjunction with the HTTP client module to automatically send that CSRF token back as an API header, and this is what the backend can use to do the verification. So if we look at the module definition for the HTTP client XSRF module, we see that there's methods to configure the cookie name and the header name, if you don't like the defaults. 
And it also has an interceptor, which is how it works under the cover to grab that cookie token value and pass it back uh, in the uh, outgoing API calls as the API header. Lastly, let's talk about the, num the bulk of the number one OWASP vulnerability broken access control, which is the accidental elevation of privilege. This is when somebody who is, doesn't have the privilege levels they should is able to view data that they shouldn't or able to perform actions that they shouldn't. In this case, there's active work we need to do to add those access controls. But fortunately, Angular gives us the building blocks we need to implement them. And those building blocks include route guards, such as the can load or can activate, depending on your system's needs, lazy loading modules to make sure you're hiding features that people shouldn't see ahead of time, using structural directives. If you have conditional elements within your components, you can use the out-of-the-box ng if, or consider writing your own structural directive based off of your permissioning schema, whether it be role-based, group-based, or something even more custom. And interceptors, which if you wanted to add API headers, such as an authorization header, or if there's any other HTTP manipulation you needed to do. So as you can see, Angular is like our soft, cozy security blanket. Without any effort on our part, we have security when we use Angular constructs. And when we need to add access controls, Angular gives us the building blocks to do so. If you'd like to learn more, I highly recommend checking out Angular security documentation because it is gold, lots of great information in there. You can also check out my code on GitHub. It has this project as well as all the exploits we talked about. And it's also a great starter kit for starting your own K-Drama fan site. And feel free to reach out to me at Elisa Duncan. Um, I'm I'd love to chat with you. Feel free to ask me any questions, and I'm sure you'll find me wandering the halls of this conference. Thank you.